There are several types of aircraft on deck. Uh, well, of course, this is a C2 Greyhound with which uh, we came on board the Ford. Many, many uh, F-18 Super Hornet, uh, both E uh, single-seaters and uh, F uh, dual-seaters. There's a growler, uh, electronic uh, attack aircraft, with uh, number 501 behind me. The new E2D, advanced Okai, and uh, this one features uh, the new refueling probe, so they can be refueled uh, while in flight, and uh, the, the French Navy is committed to buy uh, three of those uh, for the Charles de Gaulle and the future uh, paying career uh, by, I believe, uh, 2028, they should be delivered. The uh, main characteristic of the fort is the island. It's uh, located uh, towards the, the stern of the, of the ship. Uh, whereas on the Nimitz class, uh, the island was located uh, more uh, amidship. Uh, this new location is uh, bringing less uh, aerodynamic disturbances for the flight operations, so it makes it easier for uh, pilots to, uh, to uh, trap on, on, on the carrier. The island of the, uh, the, the Ford also features uh, a number of phased array uh, antennas, including one for X-band. And uh, this is a new feature, and uh, the carrier, uh, well, this is reminiscent of the uh, Aegis combat system, uh, which, we, which is new, the Nimitz class uh, doesn't feature those uh, characteristics. Hi everyone, welcome to USS Gerald R. Ford. I'm Captain Paul Anzalot, I'm the ship's captain. Uh, it's an honor to have you on board USS Gerald R. Ford today, America's newest, uh, we would say America's biggest and baddest warship, but uh, I would say America's newest, most technologically advanced nuclear-powered warship, aircraft carrier in the fleet. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, on this part of the Atlantic with you, and uh, thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. The basic specifications of the ship, like displacement, length, how many crew, uh, I mean crew, crew, crew number and uh, airing. So the, the crew assigned to the ship is 2,700 personnel just to the ship's company. The air wing adds about 1,700 people on top of that, and then we will embark normally two or 300 additional folks for the, uh, the strike group staff and the destroyer squadron staff. The ship is almost the same as a Nimitz class. I'm gonna give you English units, I'm sorry. I haven't memorized uh, my meters yet, uh, but about 1,107 feet long, displaces about 96,000 tons. Mm -hmm. Uh, our, our height above the water is about 220 feet uh, to the top of the mast, and we, we draft about 40 feet in the water, depending on our loading, how many aircraft. Uh, right now we've got just over 50 aircraft on the ship, and it's a, it's a really good complement. We have quite a lot of uh, weapons that we've already uh, loaded onto the ship as part of our previous uh, planning for our, our deployment, and we intend to in increase that and replace the ones that we've used in practice. So the, the differences are significant behind the, the outer uh, view of the ship. If you look at the ship, it's about the same length and displaces about the same amount of, uh, of tonnage. Uh, the propulsion plant is new, more modern, requires less manning. That helps us save costs in the long run. Uh, the electromagnetic aircraft launch system is newer, more modern, requires less maintenance over the long haul. Uh, is able to launch and recover aircraft, launch aircraft for the EMOLs um, over a broader mission span in terms of uh, lighter aircraft, potentially unmanned aircraft in the future, uh, heavier aircraft, potentially newer aircraft that we develop in the future, uh, while uh, meeting the, re the mission requirement and putting a little bit less stress on those aircraft because we very precisely launch the aircraft off the front of the ship at, uh, at just the right speed uh, and we don't the older system is a lot more rudimentary. A steam catapult system is awesome, it's very reliable, but it is uh, technology that's about 70 or 80 years old and, and gives you, when you open the launch valve on a steam catapult, you get what you get and you probably, we always add end speed. We don't, uh, don't undercalculate that. So that puts stress on the aircraft and the less stress on the aircraft means fewer costs to maintain and keep those aircraft flying over the long haul. So that's just a couple of, of examples of our technology. Our advanced weapons elevators are completely redesigned, move ordnance a lot more, more quickly. The design of the ship is different. If you just look at the Gerald R. Ford, where we're standing here on the, on the, the flag bridge is in the island house. That island is further aft on our ship than on the older ships. That allows for more room forward of the island to move aircraft around, to taxi them, 
clear of the, the landing area once they recover and then refuel and rearm. So we anticipate the ship being a lot more efficient at the job over the, again, over the long haul. Can you tell us about the Indeg fueling stations? I would love to, yeah. So I, I just flew the Hawkeye a couple of days ago. Uh, there's six Indeg fueling stations arranged on the flight tech, four along what we call the fighter line and then two further forward. The Hawkeye that I flew was able to land from its previous mission, uh, taxi clear the runway, uh, position itself ready to go for the next event, uh, turn off one of the engines and was refueled in four minutes as I waited to get in the airplane and go flying again. Uh, much more efficient than having to drag the fuel hose all the way across the flight deck to refuel. It's a great investment in the design changes. It seems like a small design change, but a lot of effort goes into that and uh, I think turns the, the aircraft around a lot more quickly. It's a little bit like a Formula One stop uh, compared to having to it pull makes off. makes the life of your crew easier on the deck. Yeah, a little bit less uh, in terms of work, having to pull those, those hoses and also it doesn't foul a taxi area for the aircraft to move. Can you tell us about interoperability a little bit? You had the chief of the French Navy on board a couple of days ago. Did he check out the emails, making sure they work fine? So th yeah, that trip didn't happen. He didn't come okay. to the uh, to the uh, to the ship because of the distance that we were operating based on the weather that was here in the Bay of Biscay. So uh, it was a really long trip. Uh, so he he didn't make the trip. But I, to your point about interoperability and interchangeability of forces, yeah. So I anticipate there to be great interoperability between uh, the ships, just as there has been in the past. You know, we've, we've uh, I think launched and recovered, uh, uh, we've at least recovered Rafale aircraft on the older ships uh, with. Emails, if that's common in the, the new carrier for the French Navy, then I would anticipate that same kind of interoperability between aircraft. I can tell you that the conversations and the, uh, uh, the relationships between our program offices are very good. Uh, and that's always a good thing, I think, between us. It's where, you know, kind of where we build the foundation for our cooperation is in those relationships. And it's been really good to, to be part of that. I've been here for almost two years. I think the the thing that surprised me the most is some of the quality of life differences. So our officers live in staterooms and each stateroom on the ship has access to, to a restroom facility inside the stateroom. So on all of the older ships that I've been sailing my whole life, uh, it, unless you are the, the commanding officer of the squadron, you have to put on your bathrobe and your flip-flops and walk to a common uh, restroom where you can shower and, and get ready and all that. And, uh, that's a big difference. All of the officers have access to uh, to a, a restroom facility right in their in their stateroom, which is like absolutely blew my mind. I was like, this is a really nice way to live. Also, the air conditioning on this ship is very very strong. We have uh, a lot more capacity for uh, cooling on USS Gerald R. Ford compared to the older ships because there's so much more electronic and electrical equipment on our ship. We have uh, nine giant air co air conditioning compressors. Uh, that produce almost twice the capacity of what the older ships do. So that kind of surprised me too. Thank you. What is still the most challenging uh, regarding the operation on this uh, new ship? So whenever you, you start a new program or, or a new class of ship, I think there are phases to uh, building our confidence in all the systems. Uh, many years ago, the, you know, the initial phase of that bringing a new ship in, uh, into you know, service, uh, first-in-class ship, that requires uh, a lot of iteration to make sure that the, the new technology works, that it works reliably the way you want it to, uh, and then it can work over and over and over and over again. And then the next phase is how do you logistically supply it and support it over the long distances. So here we are just off the coast of France, many thousand miles away from my home base. Uh, and so we have to learn how to properly posture all of the right parts in our supplies so that if something has a failure we can replace it and get it back running very quickly. Uh, we have to make sure that the, the sailors that we have on board have the right level of training to be able to do the job and, uh, and, and self-sustain all of the new technologies. So that's the thing that we're really refining right now with this short deployment that we're doing. We're learning a lot about that part of uh, using our new ship, uh, which is really, really useful. Uh, to make it that much better for the you know the ships behind us in the class, John F. Kennedy, as well as the, our own crew for the next time we take the ship uh, on a long distance trip.